Hello, everyone. Welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, the 28th of February. Today's topic is student study skills. Our guest today is Tammy Moore, one of the co-hosts of the show, along with Peggy George, who's at a conference, and I'm Lori Moffitt. So the newbie question for today, after I tell you a little bit about Tammy, let me get to that. I do know Tammy quite well. I've known her for over four years. She spearheaded the development and growth of an online course cooperative that has the purpose of getting professional grade tools for e-learning out to people that want to offer a free online course for homeschool students. Her project uses Moodle and LMS and Blackboard Collaborate for their live online classroom. There are not a lot of turnkey curriculums specifically for online courses. And the budget is tight for a donation-based volunteer-run project. So tools for building e-learning resources has been a big part of the project from the beginning. She's an artist, a teacher, a mom, a volunteer for online courses using Collaborate. Uh, she uses Moodle, VoiceThread, CMAP, Adobe e-learning suite with virtual home school group which is because she's based in Arkansas, based in Arkansas. She's a course designer, developer, teacher, trainer, and admin at VHSG. So I'll ask the newbie question next, which is, what are some tools to help students with study skills? All right. Well, thanks, Lori. It's been a while since I've been in the position of being the presenter. Matter of fact, I didn't even realize that the early slides have changed. Usually, I'm doing closed captioning, so my eyes are on the closed captioning windows. I don't usually get to see the slides. So I was like, oh, we've changed our map. I didn't know that. Who knows how long it's been? <laughs> so welcome, everybody. You don't usually get to hear my voice, because since I do closed captioning, I'm usually focused there. But I've already gotten a lovely introduction from Lori, and so I don't think I really need a whole, to add a whole lot to that. But as far as the newbie question goes, what I've, has really been on my mind a lot is what do, are the students using and what can help them on the study things that they do on their own. We as teachers, we usually will provide them the content, usually in a lot of different fun formats. And we provide some practice opportunities, maybe practice quizzes, worksheets, depending on your environment. But you know, almost all the students end up needing to bridge between what we provide for them to practice and what they're going to need in order to pass assessments. They've got to do some of that study time on their own. So I thought I would bring up at least three of some tools that I really think can be a help for that. So we're going to go ahead and get on into it. I thought a great place to start was to give you that experience again that you had back in school. You know, when you open up your book and you're supposed to learn the material and you're faced with text. <laughs> so even though, and I, got, I do have some typos in here too. I just realized that this morning. I said, OK, well, I'm going to leave them in there for right now because I didn't type that in by hand. There we go. Oops, I could see too. I probably ought to quiet those tools as well. There we go. All right, so just to kind of bring back to you what students face, I don't know about you, but as a teacher, after you've been a teacher for a little while, what often happens is we're no longer learning new things in the same intensity that the student, students end up learning. And we kind of forget that. And what helped me really realize that is that I, I took an edX course, and it was anatomy and physiology, because I'm helping the rebuild for the anatomy and physiology course. And I thought, hey, this is fantastic. At edX, I have a Harvard University professor, and I'm going to go ahead and learn this. Well, I got in, and I don't know if any of you have ever had anatomy and physiology, but it is one intensive course when it comes to memorization all of those different muscles, all the different bones, all of the different positions bodies can be in, and nerves, and wow. <laughs> and so one thing that I came across whenever I was there was a brand new tool, and I'm going to introduce you to that. It's something that the edX course has is introduced, 
And so I, I was blown away by it. So it's one of the things I'm going to show you. But no matter what, all the things that we talk about are going to be things, hopefully, that will give you some ideas of things you can recommend to your students, maybe even guide them into using. So 21st century colleges and 21st century tools and K-12, to what would you imagine the perfect note-taking tool to have to be able to do? So if you use the text chat, what are some of the things that if you were to be able to have a company come to you and say, we're going to make the best possible tool for students we can think of, what kind of things would you include that you would tell them, hey, it's got to have this? Okay, so I see Quizlet mentioned, and actually some of the, one of the things I'm going to talk about today is that you could use Quizlet questions too. Yeah, exactly. Being a student is not an easy job. Okay, ooh, it's another mind map fan. I'm a big fan of concept maps. We're going to actually talk about that today too. It's one of them. Assessments with remedial feedback. Oh, that would be good. Be able to talk your notes rather than to write them. Excellent. OK, highlight, sticky notes, citations, Evernote. And that's got a lot of tools in it. I'll be talking about OneNote today because I'm just a little bit more familiar with OneNote. But it's kind of the whole class of note taking tools that I'm going to include, even if I do specify one. Recording audio. Mind Maps, Google Drive. Aha, no, no, I'm going to be talking about OneNote today. So it sounds like we might have some OneNote fans in the audience that can jump in with some experience too. That would be good. Digo. Yeah, feedback from teachers. Did you get the important stuff? Share your notes easily. Use proper handwritten notes too. So when you say use proper handwritten notes, are you thinking that you want the students to be able to input in handwritten form? Would you also like, if that's the case, to have it to where the, the note taking tool can analyze the handwriting and then convert it into a text format? OK. Available on all devices. That's a really important one nowadays. Uh, an iPad, kind of similar to that, making sure it's something it can run on, on the devices. Not cause you, <laughs> not cause you to miss the instructor's main point. Yeah, because that's hard. I, I think all of us have at least once in our life been in an, in a lecture hall situation. And you're trying to keep up. Kind of reminds me of doing the closed captioning. Just trying to keep up. Make sure you don't miss anything. And the live scribe, ability to highlight on PDF. So, so PDF annotations. <laughs> there you go. There you go. All right. So it looks like some people are still typing. Draw pictures. That's a big one for me because I really, really, really love to draw. Um, I remember back when I was in college, I would find from the lecture halls, I couldn't remember long enough what the teachers were saying. So I would take my tape recorder and I would record it. And then after I got out of the lecture hall, I would sit down and I look back. I actually have some of my notes from back that far. And I look at them, and they're all drawings. It was before I was introduced to concept maps. So I didn't know concept maps back then. So my next best thing was to draw pictures. And that's just what worked for me. I did so much better if I had some sort of a visual format. Audio stuff, eh, it's gone. <laughs> OK, question generators, clickers, clicker. oh, clickers, I bet. Clickers for quick assessment. Now, these would be what students could do on their own, because I'm kind of along the line, not so much what teachers do for the students to practice, but what are the students doing on their own to bridge that gap between what the teachers provide and what they need to be prepared for the, the assessment. Yeah, easy access, citation builders, connectors, arrows. OK, excellent, excellent. So we've got some great suggestions here. And actually, I'll, pretty much everything that I've seen mentioned that would really be in the, in the class of things that the students would use on their own, not so much what teachers would provide. We actually have got software out there that does all of those things. Some software even that does pretty much everything. So we're going to have a chance to talk about those. So I'm going to go ahead and move forward. One thing that I did realize many years ago when I came across a book called What Smart Students Know by Adam Robinson. Anybody familiar with that one? 
just curious if anybody, it's, it's been out for a long time, so it's certainly not a recent one, but I think it's one of the most impactful books on studying that I ever, I've ever seen before. And I got it from, from, mostly for my own kids to help them to be able to do better. And the thing that I found that was interesting from that book that I've held on to all these years was that he divided subjects up into four different types. And that's going to impact what kind of note taking or how, they, how students are going to go about what they focus on. For instance, the first category, type one subjects, are going to be those things where the primary task is to understand and organize bodies of information. Maybe a better way to do that is just the word memorize. You probably remember courses in which you had to memorize a ton of different things. And so all of these courses, that's pretty much the thing that's in common, at least at the, the K to 12 level. Now, once you get up at the upper end of college, you probably begin to get more into the problem solving areas in biology and history and education. But at least initially, a lot of it is just memory work. And you've got some expert questions like what is it, how can it be organized, what happened, how did it, why did it occur, how are we doing, what should be done about it, those expert questions. But the core of what students are actually doing as far as absorbing material that kind of comes in that category of study skills is just memorizing a lot of stuff and organizing what they memorize so they can just keep it together in their head. So that's probably one of the most common areas that you need study tools for, for students to get to work from, is just how do you handle the memorization load? And students often have got multiple memorization heavy courses in any given year. So that's a lot of work for them to have to do. So that's a type one. Now, type two subjects, and by the way, when we get done, I'm going to ask everybody what category the subject that they, they tend to focus in what category it's in. So you might want to look through and get a sense, OK, oh, I'm, I, I teach a category one or a type one subject or a type two or type three. Because they will have a poll. That's where our poll questions are coming in. of a poll at the end so I can see how it's spread out. OK, now type two, the primary task is to acquire and understand interpretation techniques. Now, literature is a classic one. Uh, so in literature, it's how do you analyze plot and how do you analyze conflict, and how do you analyze character. And basically, once they've got that tool belt, they can take those tools into any book that they read, and then they've got the skills needed to analyze the characters and the plot and each of those things. Oops, sorry, it'll stop after three rings. Could you? Thank you. My husband's running to get that. OK. and so. The key thing here is that the students would need to focus a lot of their study on making sure they've got that tool belt. They know how to use the tools, and then they can apply the tools to anything. So you see how it's different than a type one, the type of study tools and, and focuses that they would have. Then we move forward, and we've got a type three subject. And type three is going to be the primary task is to have problem solving techniques. And these are a lot of the mathy ones. So physics, mathematics, economics, chemistry. And in those, it is it's learning how, how do you recognize what kind of a problem you have? Then what procedures do I need to do to assemble, to put together, to be able to come up with the solution that I need? So it's not so much memorization. It's much more on how do you handle the problem solving side of things. So it takes different types of tools for that than it might for a memorization oriented one. And then we get to the type four, in which your primary task is to create, to perform, or communicate. So this would be your writing courses, uh, fine arts courses, any language courses, because you're performing, creating, or communicating. Now, we're to the poll question. OK, I've already got it set, it set to A, B, C, D. So go ahead and place your vote is what category you tend to fall into with your students. OK, and I will go ahead and let everybody have some time to place their votes. All right, and if, even if you're not necessarily a teacher in the classroom, any way that you interface with students, let's say you're a librarian, what would you say of the, the four types is what you end up helping them the most with? Is it memorization types of things? Is it problem solving techniques type of thing? Is it creating things? 
And that's okay. Yeah, if it's a blend, just type into the text chat if you've got a bit of a blend, because I know a lot of teachers have got multiple classes. For me, for instance, I, I teach biology, which is memorization. I also teach chemistry, which is problem solving, is more the heavy, heavy load on that one. Okay, now let me go ahead and publish the responses to Whiteboard and see what we have. Okay, those that voted, looks like a lot of people are in the memorization area and interpretation. Well, actually, it's split all the way across the board, 10%, 10%, 10% for the first three categories with a smaller number for the third. And study techniques really is on that last category where you're creating stuff. That one's much more focused on once you've mastered the tools, just how do you get your brain to think of something creative? You know, that blank paper or blank canvas that always is a stumper for the creatives. Okay, so we'll take a look at these. Almost all of the courses will have at least some component that's memorization oriented. So more than likely, a lot of the tools we're going to talk about today is going to help across the board because those help a lot with those. Okay, so let's get into the next question. Um, for those of you that have content that's more to be memorized, how long do your students have to remember the information? Oops, tell you what, before you vote, let me clear votes, unless they already have been. Lori might have already cleared it because they're already gone. Okay, so how long do your students usually have to remember the information? Long enough for the unit or chapter module test? Maybe there's an end of semester test, maybe the, the end of the year test? Maybe they, it's really critical they learn it beyond your class, for instance, a foreign language. That's something they're going to have to go on maybe to a year two. They're, they've got to hang, hang on to all that vocabulary. Okay, now I'm going to go ahead and publish the responses. Okay, no doubt about that one. There's a huge percentage of everyone that their students are going to need to take it beyond their class. Mm -hmm. All right, so we need something that's going to help students long term. And the tools that I'm going to present today are ones that are designed where students that are using these on their own, they can take their notes from year to year to year and add to them and refine them and get them better and better, which is great for any of those things that are going to be long term. You have to hang on to that stuff for a long time. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, this is one that I almost didn't put in. I use it for my own, just my own information at, to inform myself on what ones I wanted to choose. But I think you might find this interesting. I took a look at a lot of research and the ones that, there were some that worked and some that didn't work. For instance, they found that anything that has the spaced practice, those always did very, very well in order for students to learn something. Um, but not some of those. I may, I may actually come back to this one because that's one I just kind of threw in. But I'm going to make sure I've got time for it before I throw it in. So the three that I'm going to talk about today is OneNote. Now you might already be using Evernote. It's the same class. And I'm not necessarily saying, hey, leave Evernote and come to OneNote. That's not what I'm saying. It's the whole class of note-taking tools. So I'm not saying anything against Evernote. But I'll tell you some of the things that OneNote has because that's the one I'm per personally familiar with. And then I will. I'll get that for you. I'll come back to it, and I'll, I'll get it for you. And then concept mapping, CMAPs. I'm gonna, part of the reason I'm choosing CMAPs is it's been around for a long time and stayed free. I don't know about the rest of you, but I am beginning to suffer from those monthly uh, subscription. <laughs> yeah, after a while, you, yeah, it's not that much for each individual one, but I'm, I'm suffering sub from subscription exhaustion. Anyone else feel like you're kind of hitting that category? Lots and lots of great tools. You subscribe each month. And so I, I used to feel like, hey, the tool, tools are worth paying for. But now I'm beginning to really value anything that I feel like it's going to stay free long term. Yeah. So CMAPs is one. It's not a business. They're not trying to make a profit. What, it's been around for more than 10 years because I've used it for more than 10 years. And uh, it's, it was started by a consortium of colleges. And, and it's still going, and they're actually creating an iPad app right now. So it's not abandonware. It's not something that's been left to rot. In 10 years, it's still active, and they're working on the iPad app right now. It's just out of beta. They were in beta in December. So it's still the, the iPad app is just a little bumpy yet, but their desktop product is still is rock solid. It's been around for a long time. 
Yeah, and then Cerego is a brand new one. That's the one that I was mentioning that whenever I was taking the, the course with edX, that they were using this really am amazing app for being able to memorize volumes of data that you have to learn when you're doing, when you're studying about the body. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to go over here to OneNote. Now, just as a basic diagram of what OneNote is, just in case you haven't been introduced to that whole class, such as Evernote, OneNote, I'm not sure if there's anything else. Does anybody know of anything else in that same class? Note-taking tools where it's just, it's, it's a brain dump. It's an electronic brain dump. It's, I've been using OneNote for about 10 years or so, and it is my electronic brain. I've been, I've been using it for a long, long, long time. But the basic idea is that it replaces your, the paper notebooks, and it gives you all kinds of electronic tools. So it has things like search features. So if you're trying to find something, you can search your notebooks and find it, which is fantastic for students. Great and easy way to organize stuff. The, you have tabs that are essentially the equivalent of notebooks. And then you have sections in notebooks, and then you also have pages inside of notebooks. So it's very, very analogous to what you'd have on paper. But what you can integrate in is, is amazing, especially on their flagship product, which would be their PC desktop one. That's the one that's been around for over 10 years. So they've added lots of really nice stuff into that one. Their newer versions of things, iPad apps, Android apps, uh, the web, and now the Mac Mac versions, they're coming up quickly on getting the tools that the flagship product has. So there might be a few tools that they don't have that the OneNote 2010, 2013 might have, but it won't take long and they'll get them all in. So let's go ahead and see if we can figure out some of the, some of the types of tools. Now I've seen a lot of things mentioned such as being able to do handwriting. So for the OneNote, series of products and that this is where it kind of gets complicated because they have all kinds of new things they're building and all these new things they're building are at different places as far as having the tools. But their mobile apps, you can take your finger, use your finger and draw. So those of us that love to draw, you've got that one. And of course in their desktop version for the PC, they've got it. Hasn't yet been integrated in the brand new Mac version. The Mac version got started in February. So they, every time that they come up with an update, they're adding all kinds of new things in, but they haven't quite gotten there yet. Now, what I'm doing, because I am using the Mac version now, because I was using OneNote um, as a guest operating system on my Mac, it was worth it. That was the only thing that I use Windows for, but it was worth having that guest operating system just for OneNote. But now that they have the Mac version, I'm gonna, I've switched on over. But I do miss some of the things that they haven't got in there yet. So if you do use the Mac version, you can use something like the Sketch, which lets you create a, a place where you can draw and then just drag and drop. You just drop it in and then you've got your handwriting in there until they get it in. Yeah, it's been out since February. I've been using it pretty consistently since then. And it works, it works pretty good, works pretty good. There's still a lot of stuff that they have to add. They came up, came out with an update, oh, about two weeks ago, maybe less. And now they've got it to where if you put an image in that has text, it, it can do the, the read it. And if you can convert it to text. So for instance, if I, if I took a picture, if I took this screenshot, brought it into OneNote, it would be able to tell it says staying organized. I could tell it to, to print it out as text and it would actually give me uh, editable text that set from the picture. So it's got that now in the Mac version. As far as I know, they've got it all across the board now for that particular, that particular uh, ability that the OneNote can do. The next thing that they're going to do for the Mac to bring it up to the flagship product is get it to where it can index it in the search. So it doesn't quite do that yet, but they said that's the next release. So the downside right now to OneNote is that each of their products is, it has different, different tools. So if you're using it in your classroom, for instance, with your students, you might need to be aware, okay, where does, where is each of their products? So bring your own devices. You need to know where they are on each of them. Uh huh. Yeah, and they also have the web version. So the web version, it doesn't matter. It, you can have it to where students can use school computers, create their notes, but then when they go home, they can access their notes from, from home, and, um, and, and it's free. 
they, that happened in February. When they came out with the Mac version, they also announced that all of the OneNote products are now free. So like I mentioned, everybody's getting a little bit of subscription exhaustion. You don't have any subscription exhaustion to have here. They made it partly, I think, because they were trying to compete with Evernote. So they made it free because Evernote's got where you come in free. And so as far as I know, they don't even have any cost tiers at all. You can fill up your OneNotes and I, I can't remember how many gigabytes, but I've been using my OneNote daily for 10 years and I haven't used up my quota yet. And I don't have the Microsoft Office suite on the Mac side. I did on the PC side. Maybe that gave me a little bit more. I'm not sure. But I haven't maxed it out yet. I still have a lot of room. Yeah, and that's, that's some of the other things, too. You can, you can do handwriting in the flagship product. That's their PC version. That's the one that's the most advanced because it's been around for over 10 years. But in, the, in that one, you can actually do handwritten math equations then you use the, the selector tool to make a circle around your handwritten math equation and then right click and tell it to convert handwriting to math and it converts it to a math equation. And it's got editors if you need to go in and fiddle with it a little bit to, to refine it if it didn't do a really good job of reading your handwriting. And it works very, very well. I, uh, Lori and I both worked together on building the, an algebra one and two course and, and I use that extensively to create the graphics that I needed for that course, and it works pretty reliably. And uh, it also has it where if you type in 2 plus 2 equals, it actually puts the answer in there for you. So simple math, it, it's, it works like a little simple calculator, which can be kind of handy. Um, and then you also have got the ability to record audio, and it's more than just your typical and this is with the flagship one. A lot, they don't have it all the way across the board in all of the apps that they're building yet. But in the flagship one, that was the PC. So if you've got a um, PC, you've got all the tools in the OneNote. But in the uh, PC version, you can record audio. And the neat thing about that is as it's recording, if the students write notes while it's recording, then it will actually know where it is in the recording that they wrote the notes. And you can either click on the notes and it will zip to the place in the recording where that note was written down, or vice versa. You can play your notes and it highlights the notes at the point in time in the recording that, that the students wrote that note, which I think is really pretty amazing. No, there, since there's no sign up, see this, is, this isn't a subscription kind of thing. It's a it's, oh, you mean as far as under 13? I don't think so. They do have, they do have, just this last month, they came up with a, an, uh, an office for education, because the other office products do cost something. But if your school already has that, a lot of them are picking that up. If you do, then it integrates with LMSs, and you can set your students up inside of that if you want to. But it's free. Students can, set it, can get it. It's primarily for anybody. So I don't think there would, students can get it at home if they want to. Mm -hmm. And they'll have that with this one, from what I understand, with that, with that little, that little uh, interaction one. And it, for those of you, how many, anybody in here have, Bo, have Moodle? They have a Moodle plug-in now. OK, so for those of you that have Moodles, they've, they've now got a, um, a Moodle plug-in. And let me see if I think I've gotten those page. I'll just go ahead. I was going to do this a little bit later, but I think I'm going to jump to it since I'm already at it. Um, the way the plugin has it to where the teacher can create the assignment, embed the content, and it could do it from Office or from OneNote if they want to. And then the assignment appears in OneNote. That's the student's OneNote. So this is, the, this is their special one for schools to use. So you create it. It, it pushes it out to all the student OneNote. Um, onto, I, I guess it has a particular heading that will match what you have. And then the students can work on it offline if they want to, or on the web, or on mobile devices, because it all syncs up. And then students can submit the, the, finish it up, complete it, and then submit it, and then they can even review the feedback in OneNote. So I haven't tried this one yet, because it's for Moodle 2.3 and up, and we're still on 1.9. I'm going to move this up this summer, but I haven't gotten there yet. So this would be interesting. I'd love to hear from anybody who gives this a try. And it's brand new. I, they just announced it this last month. So you can kind of expect it might have a few bumps in the road whenever it's first out. But by next 
next school year, it should be pretty well hardened up and pretty good. Okay, now, for those of you, is there anybody in here that's never seen OneNote ever before? Just seeing if, how many people are just totally brand new to OneNote. Okay, what I'm going to do then is I'm going to do a little app share, and what you're going to be seeing is their newest version, so this would be their least mature version, and if I still had my OneNote on my guest operating system side, which I went ahead, I wanted that RAM back and I didn't have it, I could show you the full-fledged, it can do everything, because that the, that's the most mature one, but if you can see what even the least mature one that they're just now, now really getting going good with, then... If you like that, you know that it's going pretty well and it's going to be what you'll want. So let me do app share here. And let me do, first I'll do the actual OneNote desktop version. All right, let me get, uh, okay, here we go. Now you should be able to see it okay. So does everybody see the OneNote that I've got right there? You'll see study skills and tools and, okay, good. All right, let me switch over to this monitor. All right, and actually, the presentation that I've been given, that's my one note for this presentation. There's that what smart students know, type 1, type 2, type 3, et cetera. We're actually right about, right about here. And I was prepared just in case AppShare wasn't going to work. You just never know about technology, so you have to always be prepared. I also had slides on some of the things that it can do, but pretty much we've talked about those things. But just giving you just a little quick tour of how you can do it, here's the notebooks on this side. So hopefully you can see that. Sometimes with pop-up windows, sometimes you can't see them in, in uh, application sharing, so check to see if you can see that. Okay, can you see that little window opened up? Okay, and these are, these are the notes that I've currently got open. So the nice thing about this one is all of their notebooks for all of their different subjects and all of their different interests are just a click away. You can just click on it and then it, it loads up that particular notebook. So it's all in one interface. Then along the top, it's just like sections. So right now I'm in the study skills section and I'm on this particular page that you see down over here. Now, it's easy to add pages. Just go like that. And then you can give it a heading. And when you give it a heading, it titles it over on that little bar on the side. So I'll just type in heading. Nothing creative there, but it's enough. And you'll notice that it automatically changed right there. You also notice it automatically dates it, which is, is really helpful. And then it, in the Mac version, we can't draw yet, but it's coming. So a lot of the input here is still in the text form. But you can drag and drop images in. So I could, uh, for instance, I could take my sketch, which is my screenshot taking tool. I could take a screenshot of something that I need and then just drag it and drop it and put it in here. And then it just, it's right there. If you drag and drop something in from the internet, there's also a plugin that you can get for your browser. It's completely free. And it, it'll put a button in the toolbar. So if you want to save an entire web page, you can click that button and it just drops the whole web page. And it comes into your unfiled notebook, or you can have it go into your current page. So it's got a couple different places that you can arrange for it to come in. And then it's, it's Microsoft Office, so you notice the ribbon up at the top, and it's just like what you would have with a word processing pr uh, program. And much part of the reason I never went to Evernote after one, I already was familiar with OneNote, so that definitely kind of slants you toward one side. But it took a really long time. I'm not sure if Evernote's even there yet. I've gotten spoiled on the very sophisticated word processing tools that Microsoft can provide. So, uh, for instance, they didn't have, you'll notice that a lot of what I do has tables. Well, they didn't have tables that work very easily. And one thing I like about tables, come to speak of that, you can do uh, title. And all you have to do is hit tab, and it gives you the next line. And so I'll do, I'll just do table. And, just, and then I just hit enter, and automatically gives me the next one. And then you can resize it. That's something that I have really loved from this one, because I use tables all the time. So if you find that you use tables all the time, uh, it's nice to just hit enter, and you've got another line. And tabs, you don't have to go in and select table, and then tell it how many rows, and, and how many 
how many columns. You can form it up on the fly, which is something I really like. There you go. And I'm not saying anything against Evernote. I, I do like OneNote a little bit better. But to me, if you can encourage your students to use either one, Evernote or OneNote, I have found that it's incredibly helpful. My own children, I had introduced them to OneNote. And most of them are all grown now. And all of us use OneNote all the time. My son, uh, my oldest son, he's preparing for a what, CCNN exam or something. CCNA exam right now, and he's using OneNote, and then he's using one, he's using a flashcard app. We're going to talk about those in a little bit, and um, just it's a, just an incredible tool. All the different things it could do. If you're teaching a foreign language, it even has the flagship product, the one that's the most advanced because it's been around for so long. It even has tools for converting a foreign language to English or English to a foreign language, which can really help it. That's a tool that most people don't even realize is there, but in the flagship product, it is. It's, it's in there. So lots of these lesser known ones that a lot of people don't realize that, are, that you have in there. Um, another nice thing is how easy it is to share. Now, Lori and I have actually built courses together. And we've actually built the courses using OneNote as our communication tool so we don't have emails going back and forth. So for instance, if we had a course and if I were to type in a note to Lori, I could say, Lori, we need a picture for this page. Well, in about, oh, say, 20 seconds, in her OneNote, she would see that message. And we've even tested it out where we were both adding messages on the same page whenever we were in a collaborative. We don't have to have it to where I type and then I have to turn it over to her so she can type, you know, like walkie-talkie style. Uh-uh, no walkie-talkie style. We can both be working at the same time anywhere in the notebooks. So we can work on the same page or maybe I might create a page and then add in something on a new page and then she might be working on another page or maybe in another notebook. But it's constantly syncing and letting me know what she's putting in, what I'm putting in, and it's, we stay constantly. Uh-huh, yeah, and it gives you indication. It tells you, I'm trying to, I doubt we even have one right now that, that's got the flag on there. But it does, you can either turn it on or turn it off where it shows who added what. So if you try to do a collaborative with your students, then you can tell who added it in. And it also has a history, so you can go back if you need to go back in history as well. Um, so it's, we've, we've used it for many years now as a collaborative. I've even used it with students as a collaborative. We were working in, a, in three student teams to build a marine biology course that the students actually make themselves. And we all worked together with about 80 students all together. And all of us were working in one notebook. And it worked fantastic. Of course, we, every once in a while, we'd have to just stop and say, OK, we've got a lot of data here. We need to organize it. There you go. All right, now I'm got to watch my time because I'm not going to have time for the rest of it. But I want to at least get you started. And there is a web version of it, which has about the same types of tools that you're going to have in the Mac version right now. Can't yet draw. Um, and if you want to add a picture, you can't just drag and drop on the web version. But you can import the picture. Um, but the nice thing about the web version, it's always in sync with all of your notebooks, all your devices, all the way across. And if you're ever away from your devices and you need to just get on somebody else's computer to access your notes, you can. You can access them from anywhere, from any device. You just log in and boom, you're right there. You've got all your notes. You can even add your notes because the web interface isn't read-only. It's as long as you are the person that can edit, you can go ahead and run with it and put new stuff in and it'll sync back to your other other devices. OK, now I see my time is going by. And I do want to share more than just one note, but I'm hoping that this was probably going to be enough to give, you, uh, to give you just an idea about what could be done. Now let me stop my app shared so I could switch over a couple of things. And one thing about a collaborators, I have to take the tool away from myself, so it's kind of a bumpy end. There we go. OK, so some definitely worth looking into. And even if you're using Evernote, you're perfectly happy with it. What I want to encourage you to do is start getting your students to use it, because that's something that can go beyond your class. They can use it across the board, and they can use it even into adulthood, just like my kids. Um, they're all grown up, but they are still using their, their OneNote. Even my husband's using it. <laughs> so he's got an active OneNote notebook. 
Now, the next tool I'm going to talk about is C maps, and I imagine probably everybody knows what concept maps are. Is there anybody who doesn't know what concept maps are? So I know about where to start. Should I jump in as at the level of what they are? Okay, it's looking like it's pretty good. Okay, what I'm going to do then is I'm going to prepare here to show you some of ours. We've been using concept maps as a family for about 10 years. And I'm going to go over here. I think I want to share once again here. Okay, I'm switching to a different application this time. This is going to be. Um, what I'm going to do first is actually share, oh, I've got to give my tools back to myself, let me see here. Okay, here we go. And start sharing. Okay, I'm going to do the Google first instead of the software, just so you can see some finished ones and you can see what the website is like a little bit. So when you go to see maps, and I'll post the link at the end. I'm going to just kind of have a massive link post at the end uh, of each of them. Um, but you can go to CMAPs and just go to their products and products download page. And you can get the CMAP tools. This is what you would want to run on your desktop computer or laptop computer. You don't need to worry about CMAP server. That's for anybody anywhere that wants to host other people's concept maps. So uh, a lot of universities for the public ones, a lot of universities are doing that. And then CMAP tools for an iPad. So you can go click that to go to their, their uh, app store. They're planning on doing multiple mobile devices. They just need to kind of build them one at a time. So iPad, they're already in process for that one. And then CMAP Cloud is a lot like what we're talking about with the OneNote, where if you're away from your computer, you can actually still access your content maps and see them. So this is the main one, though, that you'll want to do here. Or if you've got an iPad, you'll want to do this one right here to get you start to explore it. All right, now the concept maps, uh, just to kind of give you an idea of how long we've been doing this in our family, this is our family concept map. And this is hosted, notice that this is a web page. This is actually hosted on university computers. They make, they make it space available to you completely for free. And you can put maps on there that you can share with people. So when you build your map, you'll be given a link down here. And then that link will, will you can be given to people for you to share with other people. Now, um, I'll go ahead and kind of give you an idea why I think the CMAP is so good. One is that uh, with it being public like it is, you can share it. Also, let's see, portfolio. The many different uses that you can have. I'm going to show you just a couple of examples. Uh, Timothy, seventh grade. OK. We've actually even used concept maps for portfolios for the kids. So this is going back a ways. This is for my son, Timothy. He's now 20. So this, that, again, shows you how long we've been doing this. And, and so here, he's got each of his courses. But you can link out to the concept maps. And these little buttons at the bottom, so I want to make sure you can see that. You can click through those and actually go to the concept maps. So the portfolio interface itself is a concept map. You can also put, put all kinds of different documents in these little drop downs. So images can go in there. Uh, word processing documents can go in there. Any kind of file that you want to attach can go in there. Now, let me go ahead and I think I'll do a subject one next, now that you've seen that you can use it even as a portfolio. All right, let's do, uh, and see that map, is that familiar? Type 1 subjects, type 2 subjects. That's actually screenshots from our concept map. And that concept map was made a long time ago, probably eight, nine years ago. Still using it, still adding to it. Now, how about, uh, I teach chemistry, so chemistry seems like a good one. And I, what I'm doing is I'm just taking these nodes, and I navigate by clicking the nodes and going to different places. Now, I know where I want to take you, so I can go pretty quick. But if you go here, here's the chemistry notebook. And you can see that you've got controls here. In the, the new version that they're building for the cloud, it's supposed to also have ways for the students to zoom in and out so you don't have to go side to side. And on the iPad app, you can also zoom and pan. So you can, the map is, can be unlimited in size. You could just make them massive. Um, but this, one, this one's a pretty good example. Now, this is actually my concept map for my entire course. So students can actually see the big picture of the entire chemistry course. 
concepts on this side over here. They learn the concept side over here related to stoichiometry going over here. And then they can go out to different modules by clicking on these down here. So what I like about this is it helps them see what's the most important concepts in the course? What's the big picture? How does it all interrelate? So they could see, for instance, that uh, chemical equations is an important element right here in the concept map. And under the topic of balancing chemical equations, these modules are very important on balancing. So they see a big picture. What are these modules actually trying to teach them to do? Now, of course, you'll un understand this one a whole lot more if you were in the course, but it gives you an idea. Oh, is it for those, for the Google? OK. Now, the concept maps, if you've never seen one before, as you can see, you've got nodes and you've got connections to other nodes. The one thing I like about the C map is that the connections you can label. So you can figure out well, how is one connected to another. So chemical equation, develop skills and balancing, and, and it's just how things are all connected in between it. A lot of concept mapping software, one, it costs money, and two, the, uh, they don't have, they don't have the, the information on how the nodes are connected, and I like that. There we go. And, and our collection, I don't know how many, I'm sure our collection of concept maps are gigabytes worth because every year we kept building on them. So if we would start one year, let's say we were covering, covering biology. Well, if in future years we did advanced biology, well, they would actually be added on to what we had so that you can see all the interrelationships of all the different subject areas. Um, and it even, surprisingly, it even works for mathematics, too. So we've got concept maps for math and all kinds of things. OK, now, time being limited, I only have a few minutes to hit that last one. So let me go ahead and so do look up, do look up C maps. It's an inexpensive way to do it. I like that you can, there we go. All right, let me move forward. OK, and then Cerego or Cerego, I keep wanting to say Cerego, I have a hard time with that. It's properly pronounced Cerego. And I was introduced to this one. This is that one that I was telling you about that was from the edX course that I had, that it was a Harvard course. And it's based on research about how people remember and forget things. And the research shows that, all right, let's say you learn something all the way up to 100%. Your first day with your information, you learn it to 100%. Well, the next day, you're going to forget 80% of it by the time that you hit that first day. Um, but if you review it that first day, get it back up to 100%, it's not going to be gone in one day, but you'll be at the 80% mark in three days. Then on the third day, if you rememorize it, get it back up to 100%, then you'll be able to make it up to the sixth day before you have to review again as far as the forgetting curve. Now, what they've done is they've taken what the research says about how we forget, and they've designed, there's several different flashcard programs that have designed it so that it pops those cards up at the best time. It hits you, it pops them up on the day that, that they hit 80%, uh, and then brings them back up to 100%. And that way, and as the time stretches out, the, as time goes by and they keep seeing the cards, then it gets to where they can remember them for years before they see the cards again. Yeah, exactly, that spiral review that they've got. Now, the thing that I like about the Sergo, and here's where I'm going to do a little app share again, they prepare, because I'm going to get a couple things out of the way. And then I'll take us into our, our finish up here. And give me a moment while I get some of the stuff out of the way and get the Sergo loaded up. Okay, now I'm ready. I just have to give myself the tool and we'll run on this for the last little stretch. Okay, now the nice thing about the apps for this one's not an app. So if you look at, uh, if you try to research apps for flashcards, you won't find this one because this one's web based. The nice thing about web based is that it's automatically friendly to every device because it's HTML5. So you don't have to worry about devices at all. You just simply, if your kids can enter, can get on the internet, they can access it, and it'll it'll play on the device that they've got. So let me go ahead and do Google Chrome here, so you can see my interface. Okay, this is my Cergo set of cards, and these are ones that I actually got from the uh, edX course. And it does have an LTI, so if you have a Moodle 
you can actually set up the LTI so that it's a single sign-on for your students, and the cards are already preloaded. So you make the cards, and when they go into your course and they click, they actually go right there to the card you made for your course, and they they get the uh, they get any of the decks that you made. They don't have to sign on. They don't have to look for your decks. There are automatically there if you do the LTI, and it's not that hard if if you don't end up getting the maybe you don't have a, a Moodle or or something that can do an LMS or anything. That's okay. You just give them a link and it takes them to the flashcards and they can add them to their deck. Now the nice thing about these is the interface. I'm just gonna maybe expand this slightly. Okay, and I actually purposefully haven't done mine for a few days, so I have it spread out a little bit so you could see what it looks like with differing different points. Now you've got these are my card decks. So this is a card deck right here for introduction to bones. There's a card deck for basic anatomical terms. So you can see how the students just hover. It tells them if, so, if it's urgent. Notice on this one when I hover that over here on that display, it says 48 are urgent because I haven't studied them in a while and I've gone past my time. So remember, it tries to time it out with the peak time, the best time to introduce it. And so, and that's one's one that I've done, have waited a long time for. Now, even this, where it's positioned up and down, it tells you at what point you last reviewed it. If it's up in this top half, it's been something you've recently reviewed. If it's down here, these are ones that haven't been reviewed in a little while. So that's why they're lower. So up, down, the position gives you information. Side to side, it's mastery. So mastery at level one, these are cards I haven't gotten very far along with. And this one here, I'm kind of intermediate. Level three for these two, these two card decks. So students have got instant graphical information about how they're doing in the card deck. Now you also have these little things here. Notice how it all, I don't know if you got a chance to see it animate because of application sharing sometimes can't show that, but hopefully you got a little bit of a sense of it's cool, it just moves around. So it shows that, it shows when I last saw these and that the one over here is a long time ago, four months ago. It shows cards that are upcoming. It shows by difficulty, I guess I better slow down so you can see it. So three of my decks are easy for me, three of my decks are hard for me. So it's constantly analyzing how long does the student take to, to answer the cards. Um, how long, how many times do they get it wrong? It's constantly doing all that data for the students and anything they're having more trouble with, it puts at a regular schedule. They'll see it every day. If it's something they've pretty much mastered, it keeps stretching it out, spaced review. So every day they don't have this bigger and bigger deck. Instead, because of the spaced review, it's bringing them at just the right moment and no individual day is going to be massive. And then study time, it actually shows how much study time per deck that they put in. And then the dashboard, it tells them, now again, I've chosen specifically not to do them for a couple of days, so this would look, you could actually see what it would look like under that. So it says study as soon as possible on these decks. And there's a lot of them loads because I haven't been doing them for a couple of days because of that. So you get, you've got all kinds of interfaces, and the about helps to explain the research. So students, if they're curious as to why, does, why is it set this way, it's got that one. Now, looking at the time, oh, this is really close. I want to take you into a deck, so let me take you into, um, all right, now, I want to, I choo I'm choosing this one, I hope you don't mind the naked bodies, this is uh, anatomy, but the reason I'm choosing this one is for a good purpose, because I really want you to see that you can do pictures. So here's, here's we saw the deck view a second ago, this is inside the deck and these are card views. So this shows me that I'm at level one on this card. This card is really hard for me. And then as I go up, these are getting easier. And these up here, I've, got, I've progressed all the way up to level four on. And see how it's like a game for the students? It's, they're, they're leveling up. And I still have the mastery zone to go. But they can see what ones that they know. And they can actually hover if they want a real quick view of what the question is. All right. And then they can go under this one, and they can see all the cards if they want to study just from the cards just all at one place. They go, and you can see the cards. And you've got pictures that you can do and connections, and they've just added the new feature of being able to label what the connection is. So by default, anything that was made before they added that will also show definition, but now you can label it anything. So you could say proximal, the relationship between them. Is it a definition? Is it an example? Is it whatever it is that you want to have? It will give what the connection is, a lot like what we saw with the concept mapping, to show what the relationship is. And you can have more than one thing. Let me see if I can find one like that. 
This one might not be the best deck for showing more than one. It's, here's one that's multiple. Okay, here we go. Standard anatomical position. Notice there's three. It's like having a three-sided flashcard. So they could label it by the visual graphic, but it can pop up with a definition or it could pop up with this one here. Uh, because you can control the sophistication of the cards, I would think even elementary could probably do it. Now, let me go ahead and show you the actual flashcards and running here. Let's go back to here and actually run a flashcard set. All right, and I'm going to do the learn. So when you, we looked under details a second ago just to see what the stats are. When the students are actually doing the flashcards, they'll click on learn. All right, and it's going to load up load it up, and it's got sound effects. I wish you could hear it. It's got some really cool sounds. There was an intro sound I just heard. All right, and it, again, you see the, the stats, but when you're ready, you, and, I'm, and look at this, it tells you how much more to go until you level up. So in, I'm 98% of my next goal, and that's to level up to where all of my cards are at level two. So again, it has the game element to it. Okay, now I'm starting the card deck. Here's the, like, it's like seeing one side of a flashcard. And the students can identify if they know it, if they know it or they don't know it. If they don't know it, they click it and it shows them what the answer is. So that they don't have to feel pressured if they don't know it yet. And then you can say, okay, okay, now I've got it. You click the got it. And then it takes them to another flashcard, but it'll bring that one back up. And so central regions of the body, let's say we click know it. And notice you've got graphics there that you can go. And so I forgot what the question was. <laughs> I'm not paying attention to that. So uh, I'm going to click that one. I think it was out. OK. And it gave me a little reward time. I got it right. All right. And then I, then I could say, OK, I got that. I know that. And it goes on to the next one. So it can, you, they can go, don't know it, know it. And it's all, it's all, it's, it's fun. I found, I found it fun. That's why I want to use this next year with my students. Because I just discovered it uh, around Christmas time or so. So I didn't want to bring it in the middle of the year, but I'm going to bring it in at the at the beginning of next year. Yeah, so I will stop here because I know I don't want to take us over the time. And so let me go ahead and do at, stop this right here. But if you want to look those up, another thing about the Sarago is that they might not be going toward, sorry, I gave myself a tool and so taking the tool. OK, there we go. Um, the nice thing about Sergo is they might not even go toward having subscriptions because they're being funded by the Bill Gates. Uh, the Bill Gates Foundation, they had a competition um, and they only had only three software winners would be included. And, the, and they were one of the winners and they got $4 million, I think it was, to develop their product. And with the, with the shine chance that they'll continue to be, it's like Khan Academy. That's what Bill Gates Foundation did with Khan Academy. And that's why Khan Academy has been able to stay free. So Sarago may very well stay completely free, just like Khan Academy has, because it's got support. It won that competition. So high hopes for that. And I did ask them about their Moodle integration. They've got the LTI so that students don't have to have, don't have the single sign-on kind of thing. They are working on a Moodle integration as far as making it part of an assignment type, but that's not ready yet. So, um, and I, I, I got the impression it was still a couple months away because they've got some other more urgent things. But I'm thinking by next school year, they might have it ready. So that's something to think about if you're using Moodle to have it for the next school year. So you can actually do it as an assignment type. So you can actually see what the students are doing, get feedback automatically to the grade book. You can see how they're doing on their stats, and that can in turn be a grade that's coming in. So you don't you have to do anything. It just automatically is there. So these three tools, and here's where I, I've been very, very grateful for people that have posted those links as we've gone along. Just in case you've missed it, I have them all ready here at the end so that I can go ahead and share them with you. And let me zip on down. I'm getting from my OneNote. <laughs> and like I, like I said, when, when kids and family members are using them beyond when mom says you have to or a teacher says you have to, you know it's got to be good if they say, this is worth continuing to use. So, and that's what I've found with the people I've recommended it to and my own family. Oh, and there's one other recommendation too that I'd make for that you can pass along to your to your to your parents. 
Hold on, I'm not I'm not multitasking terribly well. Hold on a second while I try to get these links. All right, these are the most critical ones right here. All right, now put them on in here. There we go. Oops, only one came through instead of all of them. All right, sorry. Didn't anticipate these little issues here. All right, the oh, that link that I did put in there, that's for you to compare all kinds of different flashcard apps. So if for some reason you don't like Serago, now Serago won't be on that list because Serago is not an app. It's a web. It's not in the. It's not in that classification. But that's the best tool I've ever found for comparing different flashcard software. It takes every feature. And I, I am sorry. Maybe I'll have to rely on what other people are doing. It just wants to paste the same thing. It won't let me put my new thing on there. I don't know if that's my computer doing that. Copy. I'm gonna try one more time. Okay, I don't know what's happening with my computer, but for some reason my computer won't let me do a copy paste in there. It just keeps giving me the same thing over and over again. Sorry. All right, so I did notice though that there were links going in. So thank you, people, for putting them in there. I'm sorry that I my plan of putting them in and on mass at the end didn't work so great. Um, but it, were there any links that you felt like you didn't have? I can maybe get them from a browser. I'll keep at it if that's the case. Did everyone feel like you got the links as you went along? Yeah, I think you'll love them. These are all ones that I feel like I will probably still be using 10 years from now. They're not fly-by-nighters, and they're not, not empty my pocketbookers. They are they're going to be there. They're going to be there 10 years from now. All right, you're welcome. And I'm going to take us on then to our close. And I don't know, Lori, do you want to The only question that I want? saw that. Or did we I miss any questions? I know if, we're probably too um, far over to do those. OneNote integrates with the Google Apps for Education. That I'm not sure. I know others, other office-like documents do, but I'm not sure about OneNote. My guess is, my guess is, if they're already integrating with Google, mm -hmm. it's just a matter of time if they don't already have All right, it. They're the really, close. really working hard to, to do more things for education. So it's just a matter of time. Saturdays, 9 a.m. Pacific time, 10 a.m. Mountain, 11 a.m. Central, 12 a.m. Eastern time. Next week, March 7th, is I lead you super team of librarians. They're life binders for li librarians and everybody else. On March 14th, Avra Robinson is going to be our future teacher. March 21st, Eyewitness, Corey Street, Director of Education, AV interviews with Holocaust survivors and witnesses. March 28th isn't determined yet. April 4th, there's no show because of the Easter weekend in the United States. April 11th, Kyle Shutt, Discovery Education Network, virtual field trips and free resources. April 18th, Susan Oxnavad, ThingLink. At April 25th, there's no show because of the Den Spring Virtual Conference. This is Steve Hargadon's recent endeavor, his latest. He's gathered together all of his PD resources in one place at the Learning Revolution Project, including the Host Your Own Webinar Series. If you make your presentation in a Blackboard Collaborate room public, that is, anybody can come into the show, you can have a free room for your show. The Nominate a Featured Teacher link is here at this, the form is here at this tinyurl.com slash CR2O live featured teacher nominate without the E at the end. The form is also in the resources tab of the live binder. And if, if you are a classroom teacher currently, of course, you can nominate yourself as well. When you exit the show, the classroom 2.0 live survey should open in your browser. If not, there's a link on this slide to the uh, tinyurl.com link. Um, usually it's in the chat box, but because Peggy's not here, it likely won't be. 
You can also get this link from the Live Binder. Again, that's in the Resources area of the Live Binder, so at the bottom of the Live Binder. When you do fill out the survey, at the bottom you can request a professional development certificate, and it will come to you with your name pre-printed on it now. Uh, please, if you do request this, make sure you include a personal email address rather than a school email address because schools tend to block this email from getting to your inbox. All of the recordings are in a iTunes U video collection and audio collection. Thanks, Annette, for dropping in the links. The shows are also available by R the archives, rather, are also available by RSS feed. You can get that information here and put it in a feed reader. Uh, so there are many different ways to get to the recordings. So again, special thanks to our special guest, Tammy Moore, and to um, Patty for doing closed captioning for us today, to Steve Hargadon, the founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education, and the Learning Revolution, to Weebly.com for providing our site, to Blackboard Collaborate for a webinar platform, and to everyone who participated in today's show. Thank you so much. I wanted to mention for the archives, it might be a little bit of a delay because Patty, it, um, because uh, Peggy is going to be at that conference. She won't be able to process it right after the show like she usually does. So if you're going to want to catch the recording, give it a day or so for her to be able to, to get caught up in, in that one. So, but it'll be there. It'll just take a little bit of time.